Welcome to the Good Vibes Podcast with Clark M. Pistato and Ryan G. It is, man. Well, welcome back to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you did a little outdoor adventuring, man. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, man. You know, we got to follow our own advice. I mean, camping does the soul good. Like, a couple beers, you know, the campfire, nice. the stars. It's just uh, something about it. I love it. But I'll tell you. Here's where I was disappointed. So I was like, you know, I had the kids. I was like, you know, guys, let's let's end this right. Let's go to IHOP, get a breakfast, you know. So nice. we get in there, and I see all these different booths of high school kids. And what crushed me was none of them were talking to each other. They're all on their phones. Oh God, of and course, I, just, I know. You know, yeah. it's just like this is this is why we go camping with the kids. This is you know this is why we're trying to teach the younger kids that, you know, it's just a sad thing the way communications are going, but we're going to fix it. The vibe yeah. track's going to fix it. That's right. That's <laughs> right. One little baby steps, one baby step at a time. Brother. Baby trying. steps, brother. Baby steps. Nice. Well, I'm glad you had a good time. I need to Thanks, get outdoors. Man. It's uh, not really the weather for it at the moment, but uh, yeah, same well, thing. We got to practice what we preach. When you get back here at Texas, can you imagine if we did an episode around the fire? Oh, oh yeah, God. dude. Fireside chat. Happen. That'd be yeah. messy. <laughs> Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> Who knows where that'll end up? Oh, I'm scared. <laughs> uh, well, good on you, man. I'm glad you got outside for a little bit. And yeah, uh, and we got a special guest. We do. Uh, for everybody. Yeah. I think it's going to be. Uh, oh, what am I trying to think of? It's going to. I think she's going to show us some things uh, as we're in the middle of this episode. So I don't want to ruin it too yeah. much with trying to. Say too much. So anyway, without further ado, further ado, <laughs> let's go. And it works. Oh, hey, wait. Kristen, we're back. There's a mute sign. There's a mute. Oh, oh. We're live. Yeah. All right. Uh, hey, ladies and gentlemen, Kristen Burk. <laughs> hey, uh, I had a fortune day the other day, and um, I know it's kind of wacky, but I got. Like forge rolling. It's hard nice. to tell. Yeah. I want to yeah. look at that. I'm burning myself. Nice. Good girl. Yeah. Oh, my thing. God. Look at that. I have been doing awesome. a camera. But uh, what I got to do is I got to normalize it. It's called okay. normalizable. So I um, I bring a knife up to temperature. And then I do it with like temperature gauge to check temperatures. And this is something that a lot of people, a lot of like the, I guess, Amateur forging, see how the knife is like red hot. Oh, wow. Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so for our listeners who are not watching YouTube, I'm play by playing this right now. So, Kristen Beck right now is actually forging a knife from scratch. Uh, so, he's he's got the he's got the fire going, and, and this, this, this nice. This Look at that badass blade just came red out. What hot. You, what, you, what is that about eight inches to 12? Can you normalize it? Oh, wow. That's, see how it's real dark right here? Yep. And then it's still um, like bright orange right there. Yeah. You can see the you can see the heat waves going through the metal because the thinner parts they take the heat faster, but they okay. also heat faster. And then the thick parts will retain the heat. And then the thin parts will get hot again off of the thick parts. So you see these waves of heat going through. Oh it's wow. really cool. That's so, trippy. So, um, I can't do the hammer right now because I hurt my neck real bad. So all I'm doing is I'm another guy I did this yesterday or the day before a uh, Marine Corps veteran. And so all I'm doing is normalizing it for him so it's ready to do the, uh, the, hot, the hot thing and all the other stuff. So nice. there's like a process is that I'm going to turn the forge off because it's really loud. So. Kristen, can you tell us how you kind of got into making knives? Because you and I were talking yesterday. About how you've been around metal your whole life. Oh, please. <laughs> Those are nice. Oh, nice. These are biker glasses when I'm riding a bike because they just, they cut the wind so good. But I, I think these are from Damn Neck, maybe. Nice. Or, Those are the Oakley gas cans, maybe. Yeah, those are good shades. These are the ones because they let us buy whatever we wanted. So I just, I said, hey, I want something I can use on my motorcycle. <laughs> sure, one of my buddies just pulled up. State Trooper just pulled up. Hey, what's up, man? Oh, nice. Hey, what's oh, going on? <laughs> we have a live uh, law enforcement officer on now. Yeah, <laughs> nice. A little surprise right in the middle of the podcast. Law enforcement officer on, but Clark's law enforcement. 
Yeah, I was. Yeah, eight years with Phoenix. What's going on? How are you? Good to see you. What are you guys up to today? In the area, but I come 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 by and see how Kristen was doing. Nice, nice. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, cool part is you were just talking about doing the forging and the knife making. Yeah. Is that um, my buddy here, Nate, has actually been part of the program. Oh, so okay. We do the forging for uh, veterans, law enforcement, first responders. It's uh, mostly law enforcement, not too many. I have a couple of guys who are working uh, firemen have been up here. Nice. Uh, it's it's a way for us to, like, build camaraderie, um, have a mission. So we all want missions, you know. And that goes into something I'd like to talk about a little bit, like the Spartan Pledge and some of the other stuff I've been part of. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Nate was up here doing knives. Oh, yeah, man. that's cool. awesome. Yeah, I've always wanted to learn how to do that. It looks cool. Heck yeah, man! I, I love that show where those dudes forge. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I want. I needed to set the computer down for a second. Yeah, no problem. In my garage in the house, I got the forge set up, oxy satellite torches, all this stuff, and then I invite. Then I invite folks up. So, what was the knife that you made? Do you have it on you? No. So in in one day. I do, uh, and I can't do it now because of my neck. I don't know if you see how stiff I am. It freaking hurts, man. But um, in one day, we do some, we do uh, basic blacksmithing. So we, we show you how to do the hammer, what the anvil's for. So the hammer doesn't make the metal formed. It's actually the anvil. So everything you're doing is how you're shaping it. And so we show them how to make like a distal taper. We show you how to do, um, start drawing the metal out and different things. We make like a, a coat hook is a real easy first part because you do a, uh, you do a fiddlehead on it. You do some distal tapers. You might do some forge welding and we do all that here. So that's like lesson one. That's basic back blacksmithing. So, you know, all the stuff is about the safety precautions, all that. Yeah. And next we go into uh, knife making. And so with a knife making, just like that part right there, here's one I made that Clark actually bought. Ooh, let's see. Yeah. That. Yeah. I was stoked. I had but, to, I had to get one. I'm so excited. Look at this knife. It's awesome. So this is Clark's knife. So look at that. And I like to leave the forging marks on there. Yeah, I like that. The sharpie part. And you have the pokey end. On the pokey end, I always go spear tip because it's one of the most, uh, it's the toughest tip you can have. So if you start doing a big belly on it, you do the ones, like even the K-bar. And uh, in our knives that we had in the SEAL teams, the Mark, one mod piece of shits oh yeah <laughs> um, the tips break yeah they do yeah you do a spear tip if that tip even breaks a little bit you yeah. when you're sharp you recreate the spear tip yep and then if you look at the backbone of these knives yeah I look that. all the way it's a full hit it's a full tang so i leave the full tang in there this is a quarter inch through here and a quarter inch all the way up wow wow so you get up in here it gets thin Nice. What you want to do with that is if you're in the woods, you're camping, you can take this knife, put it on a real thick piece of log, and you take another log and you whack the top right here and so you split whatever you want. How so long you can is that blade right now? What's that? How long is that blade? Uh, this the blade long. is, I think, it's six inch or something, isn't it? Or something. It looks like it looks like good size knife, like, man. But uh, the cool thing is, is uh, Rob O'Neill. I think you've had Rob O'Neill on here, haven't you? We have, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's six. That's a six wow. and a quarter, maybe, yeah. I so <laughs> so Clark is longer than Rob O'Neill. Yeah, mine's bigger. <laughs> <laughs> mine's bigger than Rob O'Neill's, just for the record. <laughs> Rob wanted to be small and short for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> like, Clark was over or something. I'm like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> he told me this was eight inches so i have a really hard time right it's yeah <laughs> it's all perspective right <laughs> yeah well that's great well how, kristen how did you get into knife making oh look at that yeah that's all hand stitching you said right it's all handmade hand stitched that's, by that's guy. awesome that's really nice man he's exactly. ambidextrous too yeah. so, look at that. so it's made so the knife can go in either way left or right-handed and between left or right handed, you just switch out this part. Yep. And I, I got my buddy Nate just standing here going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a second. <laughs> Talk to Nate, man. He was in one of the forging classes. What do you think about the forging? Yeah. Ready, to, ready to work. 
Nice. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I want to get uh, into that, too. That's kind of cool to be, be able to build your own knife would be so That's awesome, amazing. you know? So it's it nonstop. It's like, Kristen, it's time for lunch. No, no, we're working. <laughs> working for, for, for. and for rob o'neill i figured because he was at damn neck and some of the tools we use the sledges and all that so i have in rob o'neill's uh sheath are the letters that says thor and ancient runes on rob's sheath right nice. here that's so cool I, I haven't put i figured rob would dig thor because yeah. thor was freaking god of thunder and all that and uh, so you have to figure out what you want to have in ancient runes on yours. Oh, nice. In there, it's like blessed because I'm gonna, I'm ordained, you know, and I do nice. a lot of uh, Scandinavian ancient religions. And oh, so, cool. blessing on this. And even my anvil, under my anvil are carved runes, and I have uh, crystals and things that are between the anvil and the, uh, the plate of time. And so that was all blessed. So it's a blessed anvil, and now you have runes. To make this a blessed Thor's hammer knife. Nice. Think about what you want to have on your sheet to put in some runes. Okay. Rune work is like no joke, man. Rune work is important stuff. Yeah. Nice. I appreciate that. I'll think of something. Let you know. It's cool. So Nick has got a call. Yeah, I just heard. I got to go save it. Allegheny County. So. Oh. Uh, well, be safe out there, yeah, brother. Yeah. Godspeed, brother. <laughs> yeah. Be safe. Well, see you guys. Still, here. Yeah. We'll We'll do the bro. Hey, what's up, bro? Go, go, go take the knife. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you bro. That's so cool. So talk talk to us for a second, you know, how you got started with this, but also too, like um a lot of people talk about the different aspects of steel that uh that hey, the different yeah. forgers use of for quality knives. Like educate yeah. us a little bit on that. I'll totally go into that. Let me check this. Because I got to go into my steel cabinet now. So this is one of my steel storage cabinets. So just. Oh, wow. All my steel on standby. And I mark all of it because I use a lot of different types of steels. So for, um, so this is what I get is a blank template. And one of the best places you can get steel and it'll ship it all across the country is a New Jersey steel baron. Hmm. And they just, they do the best off their, their quality. I've seen the specs. So they do the, uh, they'll take pieces of metal and they run it through the, uh, the process where they do the spectrometer, all that. St they know exactly what's in here. So it's point two titanium, point whatever, whatever, carbon, like all the content of this. Mm. The best for like, and beginner knife making all the way to advanced, I know they do it, is they use 1084. Okay. okay. And so the nice. 1084 is specifically made with that real high carbon so they can make these uh, knives. I, I harden them like they're, they're in like 200 Rockwell hardness. And then I put them into the oven in my house and I run them at 400 degrees for two and a half hours to bring them down to about a 60 Rockwell. Because if, if your knife is made like too hard, which is weird that something can be too hard, but. Does it make it more brittle? <laughs> it makes it super brittle, man. If you drop it on the ground and you're too hard to drop on the ground, you're going to. Uh. No shit. Wow. You got to get it right to the point where you're hard enough to have it hold a good edge, but you're not too hard that you're going to crack if you drop it or you bang it. Because hmm. like I said, these ones, you want to bring it, and what it is is you have a baton, which is a smaller log, you know, that you can hit on the knife on the top of it to split the bigger logs. Mm -hmm. so, wham, wham, wham. But if you're doing that and you have a really super hard rock well, you're going to crack the knife. It's going to break right in half. Hmm. These are set at 60 to uh, make them hold a real good edge, but also make them very, very durable. So, I mean, you can freaking, you can beat these knives like crazy and these things. They're yeah. going to That's what nice. I want to hear. I, I just went, I was camping yesterday and I was doing the same thing you're talking about with my knife, but, uh, yeah. which is just a, you know, SOG, uh, you know, nothing special, but man, was I disappointed and <laughs> <laughs> it did not hold up, man. The minute I took that small log and started going to town, I was like, oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, yeah. It's probably well, me in China. You need a Thor's Forge knife, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, Ryan needs to pick one up. They're good knives. I'm oh, excited I, I'm to get it. I definitely am. I'm, I'm looking at yeah, it. Where do the proceeds go? It goes to, uh, can you talk yeah. about when you sell these knives, what you do with the money and the awareness and all that stuff? Yeah. So 100% of proceeds. 
not 100 percent of profits because there is no profit in these i don't nobody makes any money so 100 of everything the proceeds go directly into mindful valor to buy more of that metal because metal's expensive sure. to buy you know to get the sheaths because i don't do the leather work so i have somebody else do it and so i bought a sheath from him but he gives a super discount because he knows it's for a nonprofit. And, nice. and Chris, and what, what's the website? Because I kind of want to bring this up while we're chatting with you. Is there a website yet? It's really crappy, but it's um, mindfulvalor.org. And this is where you could buy the knives? No, you got you to gotta go through me right now. Okay. I'm, like, like I said, man, I'm low tech. There's a, actually, I'm not really that low tech because I was a, like the technology weirdo. But um, <laughs> I just, the website, <laughs> I got to set up like a shopping site on there. Okay. But because we're a nonprofit, I've been trying to keep my expenses super low. Sure. So we, like the overhead for us is like nothing. It, there's a lot of volunteers. We, uh, the website's crappy. The Facebook is crappy because I don't have the social media people like really pumping it out. And, right. And now, is there an IG page just for the knives? Uh, I put them on my Instagram page because I have a lot right. of followers. Okay. But, uh, so mine is dollar for us. So valor for valor for us. So valor something like courage, valor something like strength, valor something like intelligence. You know, that's for everyone. So if you say valor is only for a certain group of people, or freedom is only for these people, that's why I, I like get into liberty a lot. And everything I do is all about liberty. You know, right? And when you talk about like don't tread on me, you know, it's all it got used wrong. So don't tread on me is about you know, liberty and justice for us, it had to do with taxation, you know, without representation. It had to do with a lot of stuff in the Revolutionary War that we were getting mistreated by the Brits. So we want to be treated equally to the empire, United Kingdom, back before the revolution. But the United Kingdom thought they were like lords and ladies, and we were peasants and we're, we're basically indentured servants. It sounds it was, familiar, though, right now, a little bit. Yeah. And you know what? <laughs> to an empire you know yeah. that's what happens and so that happens also in our country by a lot of different groups so if we're fighting for liberty do we fight for liberty for all yeah for all of us yeah, yeah. Well I do. amen no even people you don't agree with that's what i think we've forgotten about in modern america is we want our freedoms for everybody all of us yes that's important not just people that agree with you or that you know what i mean it's it's for everybody so i like that uh that and that's why us. That's why everything I do is about, you know, as good of a treatment for everyone, you know? Absolutely. So it, the interesting thing is for our listeners that don't know, I mean, you have a, you have a very distinguished career, 20 plus years in the Navy, uh, you know, the tip of the spear with uh, team six, Deb grew, um, you know, now you're doing these knives, uh, you know, kind of like with that kind of background, cause there's people that make knives, right. And they just have a passion to wield, uh, you know, Thank the, you. the metal. But with your background, I mean, do sometimes some experiences come to this saying, you know, I wish I would have maybe had this tool or, or maybe this would have been better on an op. Are you taking some of that experience and knowledge? Oh, all the time. I mean, everything you do is trying to perfect it. So I was using these crappy hammers and uh, they weren't crappy. They were just, they were ones you can buy at the store for doing the forging. And then I found a, uh, a guy and I think it was, um, Knight was it John Knight? John Knight, and he makes his hammer. He's a master bladesmith, a master you know knife maker, and all around blacksmith. And so he makes his own hammers. So he gets a, 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 a just a block of metal, and then forms his own hammers into like these perfect freaking amazing hammers. Mm -hmm. That some of the stuff that I do when you're when you're forging a knife, when you're making like the ricasso and you're making different parts of the knife you have to be pretty accurate when you're doing your hammer, you know? So I have to hammer within like less than a quarter inch, like an eighth of an inch. And if you have to keep striking right on the same spot to be able to pull the metal in one, but don't touch the metal here. Mm. So if you have a crappy hammer and it doesn't feel right, or the handle doesn't fit good in your hand because it's a straight handle. So he forms his handle. So it has this little area on it. It's the hand handle shaped kind of like this. Actually, like a, like a silhouette of a of like a yeah, like a female's body. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> okay, the hourglass shape. Yeah, 
Oh gosh, but it gives you a place that you can hold on to so you can really swing the hammer and not oh, yeah. also have, have it loose enough. Kind of like when you're shooting, you know, when you're shooting and your grip and how you're doing it and you squeeze the trigger like a women's tee. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> the old instructors used to always talk about don't don't do oh, yeah. <laughs> you're like squeezing it all gentle like here can, can you milk me greg <laughs> <laughs> can you milk me can you milk me greg <laughs> yeah, so funny. so again getting back to so you've used a lot of different tools but um you know, now that you're making your own, like what, what are some of the specifics that, that you're taking more? And like you gave the, you said earlier that you're doing this certain type of tip because you believe that's more, uh, you know, more durable in a sense, uh, better advantage. What other things are you doing that you think that just brings an advantage? Well, like the backbone of my knife, I leave it at that quarter inch, the full, the full backbone that is untouched. And I only hammer from about three quarters and the way down. And if I had the knife, I could show you. You only, you only want to work the knife from about three quarters up into the raw metal, and you pull all that metal down. Mm -hmm. And actually, you have to start with the whole knife. You start forming it, and you have to have a huge curve like this. Then you, as you hammer here, it pushes the metal back up into the straight back again. Mm -hmm. So there's all these little techniques and things. And I saw the guy hammering. I had a master bladesmith here teaching a course. To a bunch of other veterans here at my house um just like three or four days ago and uh i saw some of the stuff he was doing i was going dude that's cool i never like how he was hammering where he was doing and, and he was coaching everybody through it i picked up like three more things that i wasn't doing that i can do and make it better you know but then it's like the normalizing process and the way i treat the metal even after i do all the hammering and everything i do are processes that make the metal when you hammer, you go bam, bam, bam on the steel. The steel particles, the steel material, the molecules of the steel get all mixed up because you're whacking in one spot. All the metal goes boom, and it changes the metal molecules, and they get all mixed up. So when you normalize, you're making all the metal go back into shape, and so they're all like one direction. So I change the direction of the molecules and how they form together because they lock in these boxes and these other molecule parts stick in that one box and on this surface, another piece of metal. So you're making the carbon realign with this, with the iron. And that's what the steel is. Mm -hmm. Every time you hit it, the carbon goes, yeah. And the carbon goes crazy. It goes all over the place. Sure. Well, realign. And a lot of, they, a lot of them don't do that, or they don't do it with a temperature gauge. And I get it right to the perfect temperature and you have to normalize three times. So I bring up the temperature, high temperature, then let it cool down by air. Then I bring it up a little lower than that, cool down by air, a little lower than that, cool down by air. So every carbon molecule, every iron molecule are perfectly lined. Then I go, and the oil I use is uh, $250 for a five-gallon bucket of oil. Where does it come from, Saudi? <laughs> yeah, geez. <laughs> I, it's a medium temperature oil, which means it. It doesn't flash at that high temperature, doesn't flash low. Like you, a whole bunch of stuff. So medium speed oil for these knives makes it really good, you know, hardening process. So I bring it up even higher than a different normalizing. Then I dip it in that oil and then you let it sit for a little bit. You let it get cool real fast in that special oil. It's in there bubbling and rolling around. You can see it. Then you pull the knife out and then let it air temperature dry. That's you know, amazing. It, now, and then the last process, because now that blade is like really, really hard. The last process is the actual in the oven in my house, which stinks the whole house up, but I don't have a one to do it. So I get it right at 400 degrees. And I do that for two hours. Oh, wow. I check the Rockwell hardness of it, see where it's at. And I get it right around 60. That's amazing. How long does the whole process take from start to finish? Do you think does it take a couple of days, a couple of weeks? Uh, just... The forging, the actual when you're hammering and you're getting a blade length. And when I hammer the blade, like the one, I think it's cool enough. I'll show it to you. You actually forge and hammer the knife into almost its perfect shape. So that all you're grinding is to get the sharp little part and you almost don't touch anything else. So the handle is exactly what I want it to be. 
the blade and the tip and all of it's exact. All I do is sharpen it. Hmm. Everything's done in the forge. And a lot of people don't do that. They grind like almost everything is ground to get the shape, to get that, to get the handle. Well, I do that all with heat and a hammer, hmm. you know. Nice. And that's I like to leave all the forge marks, like the one that you get. I leave the whole top end of that knife where you see all the black. I liked it, yeah. I liked that's it, yeah. From the forge. Yeah, I like that look. Well, it's very Vikingish. Yeah. It's very raw, it does. You know, very Native American. Like that's what you just I like got that. a real knife. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, not often an assembly line, and that's that's kind of my next question for you, Chris. I mean, there. I don't think dudes give that much thought, or or gals, if you're into knives, uh, that much thought about like buying a knife. I think it's just like, oh, let's just go get an EDC knife, yada yada, whatever. You know, what is, what is what is your what would your advice be? To someone who who's in the market for a knife, what what really should they look for and stay away a, from? A crappy off the market knife, and it's made by probably some crappy China thing. So yeah, it's just a crappy China knife. Yeah, and if you look at the, it's full tangs. That's cool. So you want full tang. The hidden tangs they they look good, and some some people say they won't delaminate. But if you have bolsters or you have really good pins and you use the proper epoxies, those these handles aren't going to come off. So I always like to have a full tang, so you can see it's full tang. And then look at the backbone of this knife. See how the backbone is real thin; it's small. Yeah, yeah. When you see the tip here, it gets real tiny up there. So you have way likely to, to break this knife. You can't do the stuff I do with my knife with this thing. Mm. It doesn't hold the edge as good. So this edge is like a freaking kitchen knife. It's like a yeah. butter knife. Yeah. It goes away so fast. So it does have a spear. It's kind of a spear tip, but it's really, really super sharp here. So that tip it will break off. I'm talking about tools. So the knives I make are tools. I want you to carry them. I want you to freaking, you know, cut, you know, everything, stab them. You're going to beat these knives up. You're going to use your baton and whack them in a big chunks of wood, using it almost like you would use an ax. Yeah. Nice. And at the same time, I'm sure it's sharp enough to gut a deer if you need it to, right? I mean, you might have to reach out if you're in the woods doing a lot of really hardcore stuff. You're going to need to sharpen it, you know, of course. But you have a chance to have a knife that you can really beat on. This one, if I started beating on it, it's going to break right away. So if I'm hearing you right, one, stay away from China knives. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Two, check the steel. Uh, you said 10, what was it, 1028? No, no. There's a whole bunch of tons of different types of steel. 1084. 1084, sorry. 1096. I have some S in here. This is super steels. So if I go to my steel cabinet, these ones are 80 CRV2s. So that's an 80 CRV2. This one, I don't know if you can see the letters on there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. There's things called super steels. So if somebody's making their knives and they're using anything, anything with the CR or the codes in the middle, like like letters, then you're jumping. That's chromium and validium, titanium. You're getting into super steels. And if you have somebody making a knife out of a super steel and they know what they're doing, you're gonna have an amazing freaking knife. So, but if you have somebody, somebody who's doing 1084. And they run it through the proper processes, like the uh, the normalizing and the really right, you know, hardening and tempering, and they're going through the whole thing. You're gonna get a great knife. If you have somebody who's a grinder, okay, so you have forgers and grinders too. So if you're a forger, you're doing stuff like I'm doing. You're making almost the entire knife in the fire. If you have a grinder, he takes a straight piece of metal, and actually, here's a really good example of a, of a grinder. So. Not the website grinder. This is actually using. <laughs> <laughs> this is a grinder knife. So this thing starts out as I got a bunch of. And I want people. Oh, sorry, you probably didn't even hear it. So this is this is a farrier's file for doing horseshoes, for doing horseshoes and and taking down a horse's uh, hooves. So these files are amazing. So if anybody out there is a is a carrier that does, you know, horseshoeing, save your files and give them to somebody because they're amazing for knives. So this knife was made out of this file. Oh wow! Oh wow! And so this is a hundred percent grinding work, and you can see it's a big belly. Look at this thing. Yeah. There's 
That's a Rambo sized knife for our listeners. I mean, that is a big, <laughs> man. That's awesome. The edge of the file, all the markings in here. You take that's them down cool. a little bit, make them not so sharp. Oh, wow. Oh, that's cool. Gives it some good texture. That's awesome. And the handle is with a giant bolster. Now, yeah. What, what creates a stronger knife? Is it the grinding or is it the forging? Well, that's the thing. If you're a grinder, all you're doing is getting blank pieces of metal and taking off metal to make the shape that you want. And then it depends on what they do after they grind. Now, did they grind it and like really hog it out and make it real hot? Because if you're grinding and you're heating the knife up, so you're getting it hot, so you start seeing red, a lot of red sparks off. off. You're getting rid of the hardness of the knife because you're basically tempering it in, in the grind on the grinder. So you're making it super soft so it won't hold an edge, and it's just a crappy knife. Now, after they do that, a ton of grinding, do they go into a forge and heat it up to high temperatures and then dip it in the oil? Now, most grinders don't have forges. That's why they're grinders. Mm. Hmm. A grinding guy. Yeah, makes sense. They're not going to have it as hard or as good as they could have if they had a forge to heat it up. So what a lot of guys do, and that's why I have a torch here, they'll get their oxy-acetylene torch. See the oxy torch? Oh, mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. Nice. So they'll have all that welders and everything. So oh, they'll nice. torch, and then they will heat them up with a torch, and then they'll torch harden, however, and then they do it in water. So just... You have to be careful if you're buying a grinder's knife. And how, how would you know? I mean, do they do they publicly say, hey, this is a grinder's it's, knife? It's, it's fully forged. Like here, I have my, here's my grinder. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, Mary, a Mary Braid is one of the best brands out there for medium priced uh, belt grinders. So this is a two inch belt and a 72 inches round. So when I crank this thing up, it's going, yeah. And I just have the all this stuff to do on it. Yeah, right here. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, nice. Um, it's, I mean, this thing is three grand. The forge is like a grand with all the other stuff. The the anvil sometimes, I got the giant anvil right there. Oh, it's, nice. That's a nice one. That's a huge one. That thing weighs like freaking 250 pounds. Yeah. And I got my working anvil here. This is the one I do most of my work on is this. I I, when I see that, I just want to go meep, meep. <laughs> <laughs> the roadrunner i got a huge huge one right here so this is my big vice oh yeah god that oh, is, that's yeah. a monster one. so Kristen, the what, vice right there weighs like 150 pounds and the base on it's 300 pounds oh good lord that's Man. going nowhere yeah what, but all the stuff you won't get if you just all you have is like a a grinding wheel and you're just grinding shapes sure. you're not gonna call them. you're not gonna do all the stuff and i got my mig welder right there I mean, it's amazing it's a, to see a lot that. of gear. Yeah, yeah, all the gear. Involved. I also build motorcycles. I mean, here's oh. one. Of them. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's look at that. Hold on. <laughs> Wait, you, you have to talk so the camera turns to you. So describe yeah. that a little bit just so we can oh, see the motorcycle right here. So you see the motorcycle. Yeah, that's cool looking. What What is that? That's a what? What's the base? That's a soft tail. What What year is that? It's, oh, God. No, no. no. Soft tail. It looks like it. It's a, it's a 1966 uh, shovel head. It's oh. a first shovel. So the lower of the engine is a uh, pan head. Okay. And then the, the, the jugs and all of it is shovel head. Oh, uh, I put it on a rigid frame. So it's a rigid uh, gooseneck um, with oh a my spring. Gosh. So, and yeah, that's uh, cool looking. It is. Here's my TV, and my chairs are here. That's vicious, man. You sit, so you sit here watching movies over top of a motorcycle as like the base. <laughs> so, uh, what what knives would you? I mean, not everyone could afford a custom knife or ex, et cetera. What could what knives would you recommend to someone maybe to get started? What are some brands that you respect as as a forger? Man, Benchmade does some really good knives. So if you want to buy one, you know, just out of the store and just have it. Mm -hmm. uh, Benchmade does great knives. You know, okay. there's a lot of people out there. Um, I'm not very far away from where they make the K-bars. So oh, K-bar wow. you know, plant is in uh, Olean, New York. And I'm going to go tour their plant and see the process. Nice. But uh, I've always had really good luck with Benchmades because they're, they're good quality. Yeah. But if you any of the really big knife manufacturers like that, then um, they're going to have pretty good knives. 
But yeah. I ended up with some of my K bars, you'd break the tips off. Because the way they do their tip is they they hog it out and they get they do that to it. And I don't know why they did that. They should have just left it in a spear. But um, I'll tell you what, if you get some of the better custom knife makers, you can buy a really good knife for a couple hundred dollars. So here's the thing, and it's something I even learned in the SEAL teams, is you buy one really good thing and it lasts you for a lifetime probably, mm -hmm. or you can buy 10 shitty things. That's True. Great yeah. In all gear, you spend a little bit more money, you get that quality yeah. gear that lasts forever. Yeah. Yeah. Penny yeah, wise, but, pound but, foolish, right? So 10 shitty knives cost you 40 or 50 bucks each, or you can buy one really good one for 200. Yeah. Yeah. That's more economical in the end. Yeah, you know? sure. And you get so, a better product, you know? Buy exactly what you need and a really high quality that will last you forever. So yeah. if, if people did want to order a custom knife from you, then they would go to your IG. They would send you a direct message. Is that correct? Yeah, just, like, just comment on the knives themselves, you know, because I have a few pictures in there. I have one I just posted a couple days ago. Yeah. Make a comment on the post I made on Instagram. And then I will say, hey, here's my email address. Then I'll DM you because I get tons of DMs. And then sometimes I can't keep up on them. Yeah, for sure. I don't do a lot of direct messaging unless it's like, right, I know the person is looking at it. And I go to their page, I send them one. We do a quick conversation. I switch it over to email and then we can hook it all up. So it looks like, I'm looking at a picture. It looks like the the handles, you're you're kind of in love with a certain type of wood. Is it's that? Purple wood. But I use other wood too because everybody loves wood. Yep. <laughs> Dude, this is... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> why, you know, why you do that <laughs> i bought a whole bunch of i this is the blank this is the blank wood that i use to handle it's good oh, nice yeah you can see that and then you got all of the uh, brass fittings and everything so i mean 100 percent of everything is made right here so then i got these are different types of woods so i can mix them up so i can mix woods up too and do multiple colors you know i can go dark light dark Here's these ones are the uh composite, these are uh formulate or bake something, so all different woods. These are the, the metal rods, the brass rods. So it's a solid brass rod, and you can see this rod is right there in your knife. Oh, yeah, okay, your knife. Nice. so it's a solid brass rod that you have to cut it all up and you make a bunch of divots in here so that when you do the epoxy, it sticks inside the brass. So, so the only end piece is where you want it to be nice and round. So but question, middle, I'm right. looking at the knives again, the picture. Um, you know, you just showed us the grinder one, which is more of the Bowie knife. Do you do do a Bowie version? Or, uh, or I've done like here's one of my swords. So I have to show you this from really far away. <laughs> Holy crap, it's Excalibur. <laughs> thing. Oh my god, look at that. You pulled it from the stone. <laughs> you totally. This oh, crap. that is so cool! It is about three and a half feet. That's nice. William Wallace. So you can see it. Yeah, that's gonna be legit. Look at that thing! Yeah. Holy cow! <laughs> oh, yeah, it's freaking long. This turns into oh, this. That's amazing. Oh wow! Yeah. So that is the forging, and then when you start doing it all up, that turns into this. Jeez! So that sword. Wow. It will be. <laughs> that is so cool. medieval, man. That is, is so it's medieval a, badass. A legit sword, man. Yeah. That is so cool. I might so, have to get one of those. Yeah. So what kind of <laughs> what kind of handle would you put on that though? I'll show you now. Oh. You oh. Get brass. So this is a huge piece of brass, and the sword goes right here. And then so here's your handle. Mm -hmm. Giant freaking guards. That's you know, cool. It looks that like is, a big crusader sword or something. I was just that. thinking that, man. It looks just <laughs> like Templar, that. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Oh, dude. That so, is cool looking. Still doing forging, so I have to add a lot of metal. So yeah. I cut the handle. The handle will be cut off right about here. I want it, I want it to be a bastard sword. So you're going to be able to one-hand it, but this will be a two-handed sword. Nice. It'll be, a, it'll be a long handle for two hands right there. I love that. I'm going to save up some overtime. I got to buy a sword, damn it. 
<laughs> oh my yes <laughs> the good vibe sword <laughs> i mean but let's think about that for a second what what would scare a guy more is it the noise of a shotgun but or you're at the top of the stairs some dude breaks in and you're holding that thing yeah that would, imagine that yeah I'd that be would like, scare sorry. me more wrong house yeah I'm sorry let me close the door <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to drop your mail off. You're good. Thank you. I want to go get gas here in Texas. Just having that on my side and see what oh comments my. I get. Oh my God. I'd probably get high fives. Yeah. <laughs> Walking to you with, you know, your um Oh, oh yeah. Oh, wow. Look at that. Now oh, did you cool. did you make that? With your damn neck freaking no, I didn't make this one. This is Oh yeah. Damn neck is known for their tomahawks, that's for sure. <laughs> Oh, maybe yes. I saw a to look like that. Yeah, there you go. Back yeah. in the day. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. West Coast. West Coast. Boom. <laughs> so oh on the wall God. in the garage. On the wall in the garage behind me is like all the SEAL team plaques and all that. And then above the TV set is like plaques and everything and some paddles and stuff. Yeah. So I got them all. Um, it's so a this cool is room, yeah. Bottom land. So this hat is kind of related. I got this in 1994 from Tony Hawk's wife. No way. Independent. Yeah. That's the trucks I use. Yeah. Indies, yeah. Awesome. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Tony look at that. Skateboards. So this is Tony Hawk's skateboard right here. Oh shit. Oh. Yeah, and then that's Tony Hawk's board. So he sent me a half fight board. And I was like, dude, I'm 55 years old, man. I'm not <laughs> anymore. And then he was like, and he was like, fuck back. All right. I, no, I didn't. Shh, don't bleep that out. But that, <laughs> and he said, all right, I'll send you something else. So oh, he said, nice. he's experimenting on electric skateboards. Oh, shit. Okay. One of these days, it'll be a Tony Hawk branded electric skateboard. But nice. this is one of those, this is an experimental one of Tony Hawk's experiment electrics and he was testing out he was testing out like which what electric motors and everything and this is a really cool board oh wow look at that wow Got a battery on it and then here's the electric motors are right here so the motors are right here on the back end there's a motor for each side and then these um uh rubber freaking uh you know, belts. So it's belt driven. So oh, it's gotcha. And then you have a hand controller in your hand. That is wild. And when you pull the trigger, faster, slower. And then you have brakes. So oh, that's now, Tony. Tony, if you're listening, we you're you're due on the show. So you know, yeah. Mr. Tony Hawk, you you need to come on here. <laughs> God, I would be so intimidated talking to Tony Hawk. He's been a hero since I was in like junior I high know, school, right? Man. The Bones Brigade. I remember uh, all the Bones Brigade videos and shit. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, Search least... for Animal Chin. <laughs> oh, love that. He's a cool dude, man. So I've known his wife since the '90s, and uh, then he got married, and then. I was like, hey, Kathy, what's going on? And she's like, hey. And I said, I still got your hat, Kathy. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that hat's been around. Look at that hat, huh? Yeah. <laughs> what about hats? Yeah. Do you ever wear that on any deployments? Do you go overseas with that hat? Oh, yeah. I uh, It's probably got four deployments. Nice. It has, uh, I think, what's that one actor's name? He's got more kills than, than this hat has. Oh, yeah, Alec Baldwin. <laughs> Too soon? Too soon? No. <laughs> that started blowing up on social media like immediately. I had to He's jump in on that. Like, him. oh my god! I never wore this hat out on missions because we always had the helmets. We had something else. Oh, so that's true. On a mission. I'd be nervous to even hand him a knife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, if the man didn't, you know, follow proper procedure and firearm safety, I can't even imagine what he'd put a knife in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> they probably have to put corks on his forks. <laughs> okay, be nice. <laughs> oh God, that's too. Funny. What are they doing? It's like you were dead. I don't. Know. Uh, I don't yeah, know. it, it just no it, sense. Whether it's a prop gun or a real gun and all that stuff is there's still uh, safety protocols that go with it with handling any of those types of things. Man, it's just a shame. Did you read about that? The lady who was in charge of all the guns and basically the armor, it's yeah. care, all the safety, everything. She was only in one movie before this. Oh, she, no. 
experience. She doesn't anything. have experience, yeah. And here's a question for you. Yeah. Why would you get a 19-year-old just out of high school to handle all the weapons and do all the stuff on a movie? That's that would crazy. Better. Yeah, you should. Get a military veteran that's been around weapons no for kidding. decades. Yeah, exactly. Hire some high school kid instead of a veteran. Yeah. And everybody talking about we support the veterans. We do this and that. And here's another prime example of a perfect job for a veteran to ensure that every movie it's all freaking good, man. Yeah. That's yeah. a fantastic idea. You guys are absolutely right. Absolutely, yeah, that's right. a good point. And then you got an actor on there doing stupid stuff on film and a veteran be there and it's going, Hey, that's not really how we do it. Do you want me to show you? So they would also be a consultant yeah. to make sure weapons are being handled properly for safety, but also handle them properly for you on film. Yeah, for sure. Well, don't they also, I, I mean, that's what doesn't make sense because you have the person in charge of props. You have, you have a stunt stunt. Someone supposedly on the stunt team should have firearm experience. You yeah. sometimes have a safety person on set. Yeah. Clark. You know, a safety yeah, dude? for sure. Yeah. Someone yeah. that just observes everything and this and that. And there's definitely protocols that were not in place. Well, yeah. And then like what Beck is saying, the lack of experience by hiring this young person instead of a vet who's got a ton of overseas experience. And it's just firearms are a second nature. Instead, they hire some kid and then some actors acting stupid. No one has the balls to say, hey, dude, stop doing that. That's not all right. But, you know? I mean, ever since Brandon Lee, I mean, that was the last accident. I know. So that was like I was so sad 90s. about that. Yeah, but think about it. I mean, how many movies have been it's made? Shoot them up. I mean, what, what's the John Wick? You're telling me that's I'd, yeah. I'd put the probability on a John Wick movie. Maybe an accident happens, but well, well they had the right people on set. Obviously, you that's know what I mean? That's a good point. You're absolutely right. <laughs> right. Consultants. Something. Didn't they say the director when Brandon Lee got shot? It's the same director now that Alec Baldwin. No, is it? No, I got to look no, that up. I have to look that up. Wait a second. I would hope not, man. If that dude didn't learn his lesson from. I heard some weird stuff that there was like directors or producers of people that were the same and then nothing. It's like, dude, seriously, it's like something's going on. Dude, yeah, that's weird. That would be like that curse. Oh, man, that'd be creepy if that's true. Yeah, that man, that would be even more tragic. They didn't learn their lesson with the loss of uh, Brandon's life. I should have looked it up. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying to do it while you, we're all talking here. <laughs> what's, what's, what's so here. So now the movie industry has had this happen a few times. So are they going to have to re go over like all the procedures and all the stuff? Mm -hmm. Why can't we get veterans in there saying, Hey, this position should be, and it, mm -hmm. it must be, or it's not required like hundred percent. But if you have the wordage in there that this position should be held by a military veteran who understands safety and protocols and weapons handling. Yeah, as, for sure. You know, why wouldn't they write that into the contracts for like the, they have all, exactly. you, know, you know, they're always saying we're for veterans. We want to help veterans, but talk about just a gimme type of job. If oh, you wanted to help people out. would jump all over that. Yeah, but also what vet wouldn't want to be on a Hollywood set and move. I mean, it'd be exciting. You know, what about, what about combat medics? Why wouldn't you want a combat medic on set of, if you're going to have a firearm? That's well, true. If you're making a big movie. gun movie. Yeah, yeah exactly. where's the, where's the 18 Delta or whatever medic that would yeah, be on. That's, you know? it's, it's just all talk. Maybe that's why well, that, the veterans that's probably, don't want to do it. They don't want to hang out stuff, with the They just, they look over it and they just shrug it off. And, you know, they've made a bunch of movies and there's never been any problems, but then you have something like this happen. It's like, if there was just a couple things in place, this poor lady oh, um, yeah. would still be alive. It's a damn yeah. shame. Yeah. Uh, it, it is, but also too is like you know, two people injured. I, did they did they disclose the weapon? Was it? I mean, what is a nine mil? Does anyone I haven't know? Heard? Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's the weird thing because either he shot it twice, which would be the most asinine thing ever, or it was the JFK bullet, right? <laughs> the magic bullet it, there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't... yeah, it was negligence either way. Yeah. Foolish if he was trying to show off, or I mean, they just and she wasn't even like another cast member that would. You should be pointing a gun at. She's like the director, producer, whatever, like not even involved in the scene. So he's obviously yeah. doing something foolish, pointing a gun at people or I don't want to assume things. Well, but that's a good point, because, you know, I, I wonder if the standards apply a firearm safety, like, you know, point the firearm in a safe direction. And I know they got to film it, but you don't think they would actually point like towards. Oh, I'm right. telling you, in, in almost every movie, they're always pointing guns right at the camera to give the audience the effect. And even they shoot them towards the camera mm -hmm. to get the full effect to make yeah. the audience feel like they're like in the action. Yeah. Even in John Wick, the gun is pointed right at the camera a bunch of times. Sure. 
Yeah, yeah that, that is true. Yeah. They have protection and yeah. they have precautions and they know it's a prop gun. The gun he used was actually a real gun. I yeah, heard. I heard it was a real gun on set. And so that's where people are like, look, if you got prop guns, you can't mix live stuff with. I mean, it's just. Well, how many times have we gone in the SEAL teams even when we were doing blank and people loaded real rounds in and shot through the blank adapter? Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's happened. It does happen, unfortunately, yeah. But same thing with blanks, going to live fire, going to this and switching mm -hmm. back and forth. It's yeah. extremely dangerous, you know? Yeah, you got to pay extra attention to what you're doing, especially if you are, you know, even shooting sims, you know, through your different weapons and things like that. You have to make sure, you know, what you're doing because your life your buddy's life depends on it and even on a movie set let alone the tactical stuff that Kristen and i did even on a movie set it's no different and so it's just tragic you know we had the accidents we've had the weapons oh, yeah. and we do it every day all day and it's still there's accidents yeah get a freaking veteran on set hollywood <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you'd have to have the same patience as doing uh what do you call uh protective details like you know sometimes you get just gotta guard assholes. All right, well you might have to be on the set with assholes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a job. You know, it's like doing EP work or something. You get stuck with some asshole clients, but yep. you're just professional and who's like who's like the actor that's like the biggest like they're always in film, always doing military stuff, always doing gun stuff, but they're super anti gun. Oh they... yeah. That's How many funny. actors yeah, they're anti-gun, but they make millions off of portraying oh, gun. gun violence in movies. Yeah, it's like, geez, Louise. And they're always in all these military films and doing yeah, this stuff. But they're anti-gun. <laughs> that's why I like Keanu Reeves and, and John the Wick movie, because he actually trains with he veterans. Does. I mean, he does three gun competitions. Tom Cruise did that, too, for that movie. Was it Collateral or whatever? He was like the bad guy with uh, Jamie Foxx. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he did some training, I think, with some SAS guys in L.A., but put in some decent work. And same with John Wick. Like, Ken, yeah. who's actually out there just day after day for months, I think like a six-month block of just shooting. So that's pretty legit. Beck can tell you, I mean, just a couple days in the range can kick your ass, let alone you do like a three-week shooting package for CQB. You're just smoked at the end of that, man. But you're so smooth, man. You're just going through there. Oh, yeah, yeah. You ever go to Chapman's shooting school? No. Or, uh, how about mid south down in Tennessee? No, we actually went to Blackwater for our shooting oh, package. Cool. Yeah, it, it just had opened up in the late nineties. It wasn't the security company yet; it was a training facility. And so we had a choice between Shaw's or go to Blackwater. So we thought we'll just pay our our bros rent. You know, Eric Prince being a former brother. So Shaw's was Shaw's was pretty good, and uh, mid south. You know, Shaw's they were. That's like one of the ones that we've been using. For Fort Bragg and Damneck, mm -hmm. they've been using that since like the 80s. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. And uh, the cool part is, is since the 1980s, they have this one plaque and it has 10 names on it. And those 10 names date back to the 80s for a shooting. And it's a five plate pop, 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 pistol. So oh, it's a. Shit. Oh, and so shit. Since the That's 1980s, the... they would shoot five plates. And if you beat their times, you're on a plaque. And oh, so you're completely. You're competing against people that are like 40 years of yeah. and damn neck. All the best shooters in the world are competing yeah. in the top 10. That's got to be a ridiculous time to beat, like almost impossible. Who's number seven? You? 40 years of shooting. I'm on that plaque. No yeah, way. You made nice it? Top work. 10? Wow. God, that had to be a crazy time you got. Thousands and thousands of people compete to be on the top 10. Oh, that's crazy. Top 10. Nice. Do you Congrats, remember the, the times? That's <laughs> <laughs> some fast shit to clear the. Was it yeah. one of those plate racks, the five in a row? You just kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but you funny. have to do it in your second. You got to be like freaking fast. Yeah, you just got to sneeze and hit all your targets. I mean, that's lightning fast. It's... Yeah. And you're just pulling the trigger and the, and the recoil. So you pull the trigger and the recoil moves you to the next target and yeah. you're pulling. So it's recoil, recoil. And it's like a second. It's like 1.2 seconds or something. Whoa. Yeah, that's crazy. So your hands up, you draw. So it's like that. So your your hands up, you draw and you shoot, da, 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 and you jump. <laughs> that's how fast it was. It was like it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to be fast. Yeah. <laughs> like 0.97 seconds. Yeah, that's 
That's in a blink of an eye, man. See, now I was talking about shooting. Now, now I want to go this afternoon. <laughs> I know. I haven't shot in two years because I've been living out here in California, and everything I have is illegal. So I just keep it buttoned up in my gun safe. <laughs> you know, I'm good friends with like a lot of the old older guys. That you know, what's weird is like I have like Marcinko, man. I see him, you know, a lot, and. uh yeah, I remember the, that. Hey, remember that time you FaceTime me? I was in Puerto Rico and you're like, hey, somebody wants to say hi. And I was hammered, too, man. You hand the phone to Marcinko and I'm like, oh, my God, I didn't know what to say. Like, I thought it would just be like another dude. Like, hey, you know, maybe someone I know. You just dropped the bomb in my lap with that yeah. one. I was like, oh, my God. Friend of mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No heads up or nothing. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> that was cool, man. Oh, dude, man. And the first thing he said was, you know, just like the president of the HAs, you know, they were like, dude, is caveman happy? And they're like, yeah. And cool. Yeah. Have a good life. You know, it's just like, yeah, that's cool. Like Marcinka was like, dude, it's your life, man. You're not harming anybody. And you're a good frog, man. If you're happy, man, go for it. You know, yeah, dude, for you sure. Know, my life isn't, you know, it's not the mainstream normal and i hate the word normal because what's normal you know it's just yeah. wire you know or is it setting on a dishwasher but it's like normal <laughs> mode, you know? i'm gonna run this in normal mode you yeah know? yeah no such thing as normal you know well, my yeah. life is normal, you know but the thing is like i fought for liberty for all people like i was saying and then and then demo dick even said it he was just like you know you 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 fought for 20 years, you know, and you were, you know, you're one of the good frogs, you know, you did your job, you know, and now it's your time to be retired and have your own life. Yeah, and do what you want. You've earned it. And if this is my own life, that's America, man. Like the biggest freaking flag wave in America and, you know, Second Amendment, the biggest people who say and wave the flag the hardest, they ought to be the ones that are saying, yeah, hell yeah, man. That's your life, man. Live your freedom life. Freedom of choice. Yep. Yeah, freedom of choice. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, I think I'm the one that's cake and they want to let me eat my cake. You know, mm. I'm the one that baked the cake of freedom yes. and I baked the cake of freedom in my freaking blood. And now you tell me I can't have a part of that cake. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can. You yeah. know, those yeah. people are just jerks. And, and, you know, all the I know there's been people in the community that have turned their backs on you or talk shit. But I think the right people are in place, you know, leprechaun Dan O'Shea. Freaking get a whole group of people freaking kick me out of a funeral. A funeral yeah. for one of my frogs. Yeah. That yeah. guy, Dan O'Shea, man, I want to go in the ring with him, man. You want to go to the cage? You know, put me and Dan O'Shea in a freaking cage any day. I'm going to call up um, Joe Rogan. Hey, <laughs> we can get a frog fight, man. Frog no, fight. fight. I I'll bet I put my money on you, Kristen. I'll put 500 <laughs> on you. <laughs> right now, that is the biggest fucking twerk, twerp. You know, and he's doing all kinds of stuff. And it's like, yeah, Pineapple Express and all that crap. The uh, guy, overseas, he made everybody think he went overseas and he was over there doing the work. Yeah. He never went overseas. Yeah, there's and a he, lot of that. Yeah. They're talking about all the options. Like, dude, you never went over. Pineapple yeah. Express, you're sitting back here in America and you might have been setting up target packages and, and ISO preps for people that were over there. It's like Intel work, man. Yeah. And he's not even an Intel guy. He doesn't even know what the hell he's doing. Well, there's a lot of that on social media. You and I see it. And I'm not I'm not going to name names, but there's just some former operators that are on there. They're just still beating their chest and trying to poof who they are. And then there's guys that are laid back like you, Rob O'Neill. There's plenty of pipe hitters that are just laid back, happy people, you know. I don't even talk about a lot. Yeah. But that particularly Dan is the one that kicked me out of a funeral for one of my friends. Like I know. A you told brother. me about that. That was sad. Yeah. And they surrounded me, man. It was like 12 of them all around me. And they got in my face. And they were saying, man, we're, they're going to fight right now. And I was like, I was getting ready, man. The fire was building. And then I looked past him, you know, the dude that was in my face. And then Dan O'Shea's right there. I saw him. All these guys just standing there. They're all crossed arms and trying to mean mug. I was going, dude, you don't know freaking mud check. You don't know mean mugging. You know, they're all doing that. And I was getting ready to fight. And then I looked past them. And I saw family members turning and looking because there was a commotion. There was yeah. a noise surrounded. So I was surrounded by Frogman. That's sad. And there was crazy. You ever think you'd have to fight other frogmen like that? And that's so yeah. stupid, man. 
It was this close. I was getting ready to throw down. And I'll fight 12 of them. I know I'm going to get my ass kicked. But you know what? I'm going to hurt a lot of dudes. Go down fighting, yeah. I saw the family, like, looking. And yeah. you saw coffins right there. And the family's looking at me and looking at this group. And it was just like, man. I said, all right. And I, and I walked away. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, man. I, it, That's what I not think right. is sad is, and we're seeing this everywhere in, in society and culture and around the world is, the two biggest problems that we create is judging others or trying to convert others to beliefs or their yeah. way. And it could yeah. be it could be anything. It could, I mean, just look at like vax versus unvax. Look at uh, liberal yeah. versus conservative uh, and so on. And, and just, I mean, we just got to stop, man. It's like, you know, if you want to believe, you know, this this, uh, you know, this can of juice is 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 your lord and savior fine who am i to judge <laughs> you know go for it if if you believe you know this you vax not vax, fine but i'm tired of the judging it, yeah it's just it's stupid what is really that is. you got it what is what picture is that back oh that's uh ha yeah who's read here's what the president of the ha has wrote to me and this is called respect you know yeah what does it say let's see can, can you can you read it for our listeners it says, hey, Chris, you are a hell of a man. You're a friend till the end. Pete Dago, H-A-M-C. Nice. That's cool. You got some You got some powerful friends, man. Tony Hawk and Dick Marcinko and <laughs> the H-A dude. I'm sorry, man. It sounds like I'm dropping freaking names. I'm sorry. No, no. No, just... no but I, I got to ask you a, a, a question here, Chris. And I mean, how does it really make you feel to be judged that way? When you you have a more distinguished career as the elite elite operator versus a lot of these other frog men or, or other people that may be saying shit, it's kind of like you know look look at the look at the resume look at the like you said the blood for liberty, I, I you know it, it that must be tough. Dude, when I when I had I had my brothers, my frog brothers, and I look at what I'm doing right now. I'm doing a nonprofit where I do stuff and man, I'm never going to be rich and I don't want to be rich, man. I'm, I'm happy. I have a motorcycle, you know, I got my truck, you know, I have a 1977 Dodge truck. Nice. Yeah. I ride that thing around and people are always looking at it. Cause it's just this old cool truck, man. Nice. You'll see Warlock. It's a 1977 Warlock. So you want to stereotype somebody when you look at me from that surface, you want to stereotype me, because you see me wearing a freaking dress or doing whatever you want to, you know, riding around in my Harley, man, I got my cut on and I'm in a club, man. I was in a club for a long time. You know, I was one of the, I was a pipe hitter in a motorcycle club, you know, we we're, they called us, I was one of the enforcers. So that means I fight a lot, but I don't do that anymore. You know, I think I've changed a lot. I think I've grown. I, I see my whole past and I've, I think I've, I don't know. I don't want to call it maturity, but I've seen so much stuff. I've seen a lot of hate. I've seen a lot of people with that tough air and that, that bravado, the mochismo and all the other stuff. And I see all that just turns into destruction, you know, it does. And, and I'm trying to bring more of that peace. And I'm not going to sound like a, a hippie, but a tough hippie, you know, and I like that. Cause I think that's what Mitch says a lot. Violent hippie. Yeah. <laughs> it's true though that describes a lot of frogs is that yeah. you know we're very capable of violence but we'd rather just be cool and hang out and do our thing and I've we've seen enough violence and we know where it ends up it never ends up well that's a good we point see so much violence and i've seen so much and then i see this other side of people who will never see violence and then i want to try to protect them from that violence but then i have those violent people like the frog man when they surrounded me it was like dude they were basically surrounding somebody who didn't want violence. He wasn't looking for violence. He didn't want anything except to pay respect to a friend, you yeah. know, follow the model. And so that's the problem is you have violent people who never learn how to go past the violence, who mm -hmm. never want to see the other side. Sure. And I, I saw this, this one thing when you say there's always another way. And so if you see that you're trying to do something and it's not working, there's another way, man. Mm -hmm. The violence in the world, you know, has never worked out. The Crusades 
created more crusades, created more hate, created more division, created more crusades that we're yeah. still fighting today, man. Yeah. And if you're not going to tell me that the crusades of today are not connected to crusades of a thousand years ago, you know, today, whatever it was, it's all connected. Yeah. If you see all the plane hijackings in the 1970s mm. are not connected today, man, you're, you're fooling yourself. Yeah. So all of this is violent. And nobody has ever looked for another way. Violence but breeds more violence. Always. Yeah. And so that's all I'm saying is those frogmen, they're still doing the crossed arms and tough stuff. They're still surrounding people and trying to beat them up. Yeah, that's sad. But there could have been another way. So what's the other way? You know? Yeah. And, and why wouldn't you want to find another way besides still doing the crossed arms and the clenched fists? Oh, well, it's You're very, it's just sophomoric. It's immature. You know, that that's how like we were in our twenties in the teams, these tough guys and all that. But as you get older, you just, you realize, you know, other things like family and, and true friendships are more important. And yeah, it's, it's a shame that they're still stuck in that mode though. And these guys are probably in their forties, maybe fifties, who knows, but all those guys are in their fifties and older. That's what's embarrassing. It's not like, okay, he's a young 23 year old team guy. He's just kind of young and stupid. These guys are in their fifties. Like you're still acting like this in your fifties, dude. It's freaking ridiculous. It is. You got, you got some other frogmen. They're making tons of money off of tough, off yeah. of like, yeah, ah. yeah. yeah for you sure. Buy it down a little bit. You yeah. know, there's another way. Yeah, for you sure. People to see the other side of frogs. Yeah. Do you want to always be like these tough, crazy dudes that are always yelling? Yeah, that's such a small part of it. There's such a, a bigger side to the teams and team guys and that tough guy stuff. And it's it's sad that that's the small part they keep portraying. That's just like 10% of the total equation, if that, you know. You know what's funny? Is check this out. Amongst like the LGBT the gay community, they mm -hmm. have these pride events. And then always on a picture in the pride events, all these dudes in banana hammocks freaking being jerks. Yeah. It's just he was a frogman. Yeah, yeah, sure. They're basically wearing banana hammocks and freaking making lots of noise. Yeah. And it always goes to the banana hammock and the freaking loud frogman. Yeah, yeah. That's only one out of like a thousand. Yeah, that's true. It's funny what they show. Yeah. The gay community, like you don't know, like the the dudes that I know who hey, they're gay. But mm. these guys are in trucks and they're hunting all the time and they're just like they're regular folks. They have families, man. Yeah. It's, you never get to see that part of the community, which are just like, dude, they're preachers or they have families. They have, they're good guys, man. Mm -hmm. They never did anybody any harm. They're peaceful, just good people. You, but you, you never see that. You almost have to find the irony. Like you're talking about the, the, you know, the guys that want to carry on the persona of being badasses and especially veterans. I mean, you know, you, as you said, you defended Liberty and, you know, there's a statement in one of our documents that says in the pursuit of happiness yeah so so why if you defended that you shed it blood for that then why do you want to prevent anyone pursuing happiness whatever that means yeah. color religion gender sexuality go go down the list we all are entitled to pursuit of happiness That's, yeah we forget that sometimes and, yeah. and especially when we judge others or you would hope that the older you get, the more you realize this stuff. That's the wisdom of life. And yes. the more we leave our old ways behind us, the way we were in our 20s and even 30s. So yep. it's and most of us are that way, though. Like you said, those jerk frogmen, it's a small group in and our group. Camera and all the limelight is on those jerks. Mm -hmm. And then those jerks end up making tons of money off of being a frog. I know. It's just perpetuates it because, hey, if I'm really loud and I wake up at four o'clock in the morning and make a lot of noise, I can make a lot of cash. <laughs> So, so more frogs are wake up at four in the morning and doing videos and being all tough and going crazy. So, cause they're all making money. So it perpetuates the thing yeah. that 20 year olds think that that's the only way to be a frog. Yeah. Yeah. That's only 1%, man. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a whole bunch of us out here. that are just doing, we're forging knives and doing these seminars and this trauma therapy. I'm doing my master's degree right now. Oh, nice. at the for uh, mental health counseling. Nice. I kept going in front of people and giving speeches. And I was talking about the suicide rates right now are 19.7 per 100,000 amongst active duty military. And that's a lot when you start looking at the military and readiness and everything else. 
So I wrote this huge paper in his project called Project Prism, and that's a whole other thing, but it's preventing and reducing uh, instances of suicide in the military, P-R-I-S-M. So nice. Prism, so and it's a whole thing. And then you think about the veterans, you know, we have 22 a day taking their own lives. Mm-hmm. That's the project I'm doing right now with Mindful Valor is alternative things and giving missions to veterans to try to reduce the amount of of uh, of taking their own lives. You know, yeah. And, again, uh, here here are, you have people. You either are taking the persona, the lifestyle. You're pounding your chest and you're going to make money, or you have people that says, "Listen, I want to give back. Mm-hmm. I want to give back to the community. I want to give back to veterans in need, and I'm going to use." what i know my connections my skills and let's 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 put it in a different sense of paying it forward that that's kind of cool man yeah and, and that's what i'm trying to do so i'm going to get my degree in mental health counseling so i can counsel veterans and, and i also have enough knowledge base that i can make the programs better mm-hmm. so i would go in and i would be a liaison or a consultant to other nonprofits saying hey because there's a lot of nonprofits that are run by civilians they don't know how to deal with veterans you know and so I'd go in there and try to help them with my mental health master's degree. I don't work on my PhD. I already have part of my thesis already done for a PhD. And so I want to have enough knowledge so I can help out other groups, plus help out my group. And I can counsel some veterans on the side when I do it as far as groups or do these group things. I have um, three veterans from Texas who are going to get into a 15 pack van and drive to New York to be in my forge during Sweet. Thanksgiving. And so I'm paying for the van to get them up here. And then I got place. I got a house. There's a Valor house. So there's a Valor house that can house uh, like eight veterans that I, that's part of the Valor project. So Valor is uh, is um, veterans uh, advancing in leadership and uh, op- leadership opportunities and resilience. So V-A-L-O-R. So I like the enemy stuff, how they always have acronyms. <laughs> Valor. You think about veterans, advancement, and leadership opportunities and resilience, V-A-L-O-R. But that's what it stands for. So whenever you think about valor, I want leadership opportunities. So this is not only um, you helping yourself, but if you're a good leader and you have the opportunity to be a good leader and know the techniques, you're going to do better to help out other veterans to do better in their lives and give them missions to then make their lives better. And when you have a mission, you're never going to quit because I'm never going to leave my guys behind because I got a mission. I'm going to be- Purpose, yeah, you got a purpose, yeah. Right. And if you know anything about Boone Cutler and the Spartan Pledge, so look up Spartan Pledge and write down the Spartan Pledge. Spartan Pledge is, I will not take my own life until I speak to my battle buddy. And I will find a mission in order to promote the readiness and big stuff. So basically, I can never take my own life until I talk to my battle buddy. Now, I'm not saying you can never take your own life because I don't want to take out your ability to have choice in your life. But the choice has to happen after you talk to me if I'm your battle buddy. So if me and you do the pledge to each other, I can never do anything to harm myself until I call on the phone you at 2 o'clock in the morning and I say, hey, Clark, I'm going through this and this and this, man. It's a really tough time. I got 10 on 10 pain and my neck right now is so bad. I can't move and I'm eating all the oxys and I ran out because they give us all these pain drugs, which are all band-aids to what the real problem is. Yeah, for sure. All I'm doing is curing the pain by oxy and by whatever else they give me, tramadol, trazodone. I can name all the drugs that VA shoves on us all the time. The VA wants us to be zombies. Mm-hmm. They don't want to actually fix. They want to put band-aids on a the pain. They want to put band-aids on your mental things going on inside your head through stuff that doesn't work. You know what works for me is when I have my friends in here, man, Nate just stopped by because he saw my truck was in the driveway. He said, hey, just stop a minute because he drove by, saw my truck. He did a U-turn. I know what he did. He was going past here, took a U-turn at a road right up the road, and then came back and pulled in and said, hey. Saw the door open. He walks in. Hey, what's up, Nate? Because he's <laughs> man. Yeah, a, that's cool. Yeah. So yeah. I have checks by my trooper buddy. I have a buddy check by the military liaison down there. I buddy check you. You've had calls for sure. Yeah. Morning, and yeah. I answer all the time. You've yeah. called me. And I've called you. Yeah. 
Many and times, yeah. Oh, so much, man. So your mission to every veteran out there right now, I give it to you, is find your buddy and do buddy checks. Buddy checks are huge. Like him, you're helping him, and you're helping yourself. Yeah. Yep. You're making it a tighter, tighter bond. And I would, I would, I would, I would want to extend that too to non-military because I just think it's such it's well said and well thought out. Look, it, this is a fucking decent shitty. human thing to well, do. Yeah, it's shitty times right now. You, you know, economy, gas, job. I, you just everyone's getting shit on. And look, depression, anxiety is at all time high. You yeah. know, like like what Kristen's saying, everyone's answer is here's drugs, here's drugs. So yeah. you know, even if you're not military or a first responder, go go call your friend and say, Listen, I'm gonna check on you. You're gonna check on me. We just need this because it it, it take you know, two is one, one is none, as y'all say. Well, just talking about stuff makes it better, it gets it off your chest. If I'm yep. going through dark times, I'll call Kristen, vice versa, or I've called yeah. you as well, Ryan. Yeah. You know, it doesn't even have to be military to military. Sometimes just a civilian buddy being there. Yeah. What's I'm that? Gonna call, I'm going to call up Tony Hawk right now. You want to talk to Tony? <laughs> no way. <laughs> no. Oh, it's buddy checks, man. <laughs> you call him, man. Hey, it's it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Sorry, bro. Oh, yeah. it's, my, it's 11 his time. But, yeah, just <laughs> day, like your buddies that you can call and do it because it helps everybody. Yeah. And I yeah. Sometimes it just turns into weird conversations, man. That's and awesome, though, you know? It's, yeah, I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world because we can talk about shit. Right, but that's what it, makes you buddies. No one else talks about it. Yeah, it's great. It, you're, a real buddy, a real friend is someone you could be you in front of, and you could be weird, you could be wacky. Yeah, you, be yourself. You, know, you could say, I love you. You could say, fuck you. There's no difference. Oh, you. all the above. Sometimes yeah. in the same sentence, yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm like... I really, really believe that the limelight or the camera or something, how do we get it away from all those, the frogmen who all they're doing is making noise and being loud and they're doing their muscles and they're going, Ugh. why can't we show them where the muscle is up here, man, the gray matter? Well, we do through people like you or myself. People see us on social media too and they say they're different. They're not running around with their shirts off and flexing and these, these two are different. They're kind of mellow, happy, silly, doing their own things. And, and you and I, what you see is what you get. Social media is the same as in person. I'm not one of those guys, and neither are you, that you meet in person and you're like, he's kind of lame, like it, totally different than social media, this big, wow. Then you meet him in person and they kind of suck. You're like, what the hell? So I will say the three of us that are on here now are the <laughs> same in person as we are anywhere else. Oh, and that's yeah. cool, man. That's There's the way no it should difference. be. Yep. It'd be fun to hang out, you know, just chill and say, "Hey, let's get a beer." Yeah, just yeah, kicking it. A beer. If 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 it's us three, it's going to be at least five. The <laughs> <laughs> podcast I did with Ritland. Oh, I did. That was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And uh, here's the thing about that podcast: is I look at it and I go, "Man, I was fucking drunk." Because <laughs> me and Mike were talking the night before the podcast was supposed to happen in the morning the next day. Yeah. Flew in, and then me and Mike were hanging out, and then uh, just chilling, having a beer, cooking some food, and we were talking like frogmen do. Yeah. And me and we're talking about too much stuff right now. It's got to be like fresh on the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was four beers in, and uh, uh... he was like, "Hey, hey, Beck, do you want to just start the podcast right now and just do it tonight? And then tomorrow morning we can chill out." And I was all like, "Yeah, whatever, man." <laughs> <laughs> Back, dude, and start getting everything set up. And then I'm sitting there behind the thing in a microphone with another beer, like a jackass. And uh, so I drank another one. Now I'm on like six. And he uh, goes, oh, Mic drop. And we have Kristen back. And I'm like, All right, dude. <laughs> I'm like, like crap. And I'm like, Six, six IPAs, like the double. Oh, oh, yeah. They're oh, strong. That's trouble. Dude. There that's... you go. <laughs> I, same thing happened to me when I was there. Yeah. Look, could you know, like I was getting drunker as the show went on. I was just like uh, I was just talking about stuff, and I was like, "Man, I'm not doing the best I can on here." <laughs> For our listeners, I just have to say, Hamidi. Oh God, the, my, the episode where we had Sergeant Major Hamidi on, I was hammered and just constantly interrupting him, and I was like, "Oh, uh, so I got to have him back on to tell his real story." But yeah, doing podcasts hammered never ends well. You think it's going good till you listen to it, and you're like, "Oh my God." <laughs> I thought it was good. Oh, oh hey, who's that? I was gonna say want to see my but I said, hey, here's my cat. <laughs> That's awesome. 
So oh, he, gosh. I, well, hey, so, listen, Beck, we got to get wrapping up here. We got to we got to close it out. But I just want to thank you for your time and, and thank you for what you're doing. And I'm super pumped about that knife. I can't wait. Yeah, and I, I'm going to reach out to you because I uh, shoot. I, if I start showing that off in Texas, man, I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of jealous Texans and they're going to. Yeah, pound, get the Bowie knife. Door. Hell yeah, get that dude. Bowie knife, dude. The I'll, Bowie knife. Is... I will wear it in public. I, I'm yeah. a belt. You <laughs> I'm know wearing me. mine. I I my everyday knife. I'm wearing mine every day. <laughs> it, man. It's a beater. It's one you yeah. want to use. I love and if you, it. if you mess the sheath up because you're wearing a lot, then we'll just make another sheath for you. So nice. before we close out, what are what are some places you want to drive? We we talked about IG. Uh, for, to, if anyone interested in learning more uh, about your custom knives, you said do not direct message. Go make a comment on the knife uh, and go from there. But what about some of these other things that you're passionate in? Like you said, uh, the, the different orgs. You know, Where can people go to uh, check these out? So here's the thing that I tell everybody and, and people give money. There's a lot of like, and especially at the end of the year for taxes, you want to give a certain amount to have tax credits and all that, you know, and then people go online and they give the wounded warrior project, which they've done some good stuff, but they've also got a lot of people in there making, you know, a hundred thousand dollars salaries, a lot of them, you know? And so there's really big organizations like that, you know, leave that to the, to the big groups that are doing the big money. But if you want to give them like 50 bucks, you know, make your $50, you know, mean something. And what you want to do is you want to find a nonprofit of your veteran, a veteran nonprofit that's local to you. So if you're in New York City, there's a group called uh, My Brother Vinny. And uh, those guys are, are amazing. So New York City, My Brother Vinny. If you're north of New York City in the New England area, there's a group called Project New Hope. And there's a, in San Francisco, there's a place called... Um, Swords to plowshares. There's a San Diego has a couple of really good ones. But what I'm doing is I'm naming off some big cities and ones that I know personally, and I can name off about 40 or 50 more in cities that are local to them. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is you want to find your passion and find your local nonprofit and check them out. You know, look at them, meet the person who like founded it or read about them and see what they're doing and give your money to them. Because yep. the thing is, if you give $50 to the Wounded Warrior Project, your $50, about $3 of that is going to go to a project for a veteran. Yeah. If you give $50 to my brother Vinny, $50 is going to a veteran. Yeah. If you give $50 to source of plowshares, they're a little bit bigger and they have some overhead. So out of your 50, probably 48 or $49 is going to go to a veteran. Nice. What I'm saying is you want to find, and don't do it for me because I'm not local to you. I don't want any mindful valor. If you can, it'd be cool, but find your local one or find a small one that's doing stuff that's big. And I'll tell you what, if you give $50 to mindful valor, $50 is going into a veteran or it might go into buying some steel because we make a steel, we give more knives out, but that's yeah. still going to a veteran because if you come here and you make a knife, you keep the knife. Yeah. Oh, wow. No. And That's speaking cool. of that, you said you had a van coming from Texas. So what happened if, if uh, a veteran or first responder, they want to put together a group and come out and do this uh, type of forging, uh, do they do the same thing, just comment on your knives? Uh, yeah, comment there first. But if you if you know me, you know I try to be very streamlined, and I learn a lot of lessons. The reason my Instagram is Valor for Us, because it was available on Instagram, because who's going to do Valor for Us? It doesn't even make any sense. It doesn't spell anything. It's got a number in there. Like an Instagram title, you don't want numbers. You don't want stuff that's confusing. So I picked it up. So I have it on Instagram. I have it on Twitter. I have it on Facebook. I have the Gmail, Valor for us at Gmail. So if they but have it, a group that wants to come out and train with you or learn how to build knives, they can just send you an email maybe? i curious about it. And there's got to be some skin in the game. So I will pay for your van and then maybe you'll pay for the gas or something, but you're going to have to, it's going to be a little expense out of your pocket because there has to be skin in the game. Sure. And steel's it's not, not cheap. cheap. Steel's not cheap. Like just like when you, when you give, when you say college free for everybody, it's like <laughs> it's, it's total BS because yeah. there's skin in the game and you get a bunch of jackasses who drink and join a fraternity and don't yeah. get anything out of it. Yeah. You're, happy, you're gonna pay for it, man. You, there's gonna be some money in there, Somebody and so we're gonna work that out. I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna give you three thousand dollars for travel from Texas, and then when you get up here, I have a house for you to stay in. I got this and that, and it's gonna be pretty easy. But then you're gonna end up with like maybe a grand or grand and a half of gas. That you gotta split up between 
the three or four of you, you know? That's so very no, reasonable, though. That's doable. There's no such thing as a free ride, man. There's no such thing as a free lunch, Dean Staffel. Yep. If I give you a free lunch, you're not going to appreciate it, you know? Yep. Yeah, well that's said. true. Well said. Well, it's it, one of those lessons, you know? So, so the, the things I want you to do is find your local nonprofits that are doing veteran projects, you know? And uh, find a local nonprofits that are doing good work that are using your 50 bucks to do $50 worth of veteran stuff. I make no find the ones that don't have salaries for their board. So the board for Mindful Valor, nobody makes any money off it. There's yep. zero, zero profit to any member. Now we might reimburse some expenses because you did that and that and that, you know, because we don't want it to be painful on the board or the people who are teaching. Mm. You know, we want them to get their break even and then give a bit. And so if you're out here, we're gonna do a lot of bonfires, we're gonna do some drinking. You know, you smoke cigars, man. Hell yeah. And, you know, do do what you got to do and have your fun. And we're going to be foraging. We're going to be talking stuff. And plus, I have people here who are professional mental counselors who are not going to mental counsel, but they're going to have stuff that they can tell you about. Uh, the greatest book I ever read is the one. Did I tell you about this book? It's called uh, The Warrior's Soul or The Warrior's Return. Warrior's Return. And it's an amazing book by Dr. Edward Tick. And that's one that you want to post on there. You write say, that down. Buy it on Amazon. And I tell you, every veteran, anyone who's a dealing with trauma, every fireman, every policeman, everyone out there should buy this book and really take a serious look at it. I think he has an audio too. Yeah, good. The man that wrote it has been working with Vietnam veterans for about 50 years, man. This guy is deep in the Vietnam veteran community and he's learned a lot. And uh, he's got one kind of warrior soul, but I think the best one for you, for anybody just as a first look, first look, buy the book Warrior's Return by Dr. Edward Tick. And you will learn so much. There's another one, and I can't remember the author, but it's, it's The Body Keeps the Score, which is really, really good. That's a, that's I love all those books. Tip. I do a lot of audio books when I'm driving to and from different job sites. Driving, yeah, man. You're driving for an hour, two hours, man. This is part um, of the book. Yeah. Another good one is it's uh, by Boone Cutler, and I think it's called FPL. But look up Boone Cutler; he's the one that has a Spartan pledge. Oh, okay. Every, yeah. veteran, every law enforcement, every uh, fireman should take the Spartan pledge and do it with a battle buddy. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking up this Warriors Return, and it actually says uh, the subtitle is actually "Restoring the Soul After War." So. Oh, nice. Um, That'll be PTSD. my next book. No, this, yeah, this is actually awesome. five stars all around, 117 oh, rated. So. Is, Dr. Tick, he will come on your podcast. He'd be a great. That'd be awesome. If I will. I'll, I'll listen to his book first. Yeah. 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 Those guys that I was talking about kind of making a little bit of fun, but I shouldn't be making fun because they're yeah. doing a lot of physical. They're doing it. Oh, Rudy. Um, who's the sniper? Uh, Rudy. Uh, he's awesome. He does the blue... Um, Blue the Force, blue. Rudy Reyes? Rudy Reyes, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we had we, him we, on here. Yeah, yeah, we had Rudy whoa. on here. Yeah, Rudy's great. <laughs> He's the man. Oh, he, right. does, he lifts weights, man. He's really, he's too super macho, totally done. He's got a big heart, though. He's not, oh, he's not a heart. false tough guy. He's got a big heart, man. Yeah. You have, you're the loud, tough guy, frogman. They don't have the soul. They don't have no. the... Oh, Rudy has a big soul, man. Yeah. All he do is, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Does, uh, but he also does a lot of like the really he's good spiritual. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, he's big really time. spiritual. Yeah. That's the thing. You got to think about the three legged stool. The three legged stool is mind, body, and spirit. You know, you got to have yeah. the intellectual. And that's you reading this book by Dr. Ed Tick is the intellectual side. Nice. Then if you want to do the spiritual side, get Rudy. Then if you want to do the physical side, but yeah. you find all three of those in one person. That's rare. That's rare to find someone that balanced. Yeah. The balanced frogman has a PhD and he can still bench for 300 pounds and he goes out there and he does freaking yoga and sits out there doing a vision quest. Yeah. Meditation. All that stuff's important. Yeah, cheers. On my back, if I showed you the back where the bonfires, you want to see where my bonfires are and see the spiritual and where we do the good stuff. Yeah. Let's see it. Take yeah, us on man. a tour. Let's see it. <laughs> that, that's awesome. Who doesn't like, like bonfires, cigars, and then you wake up and, and make some knives. I mean, come on. Uh, Talking about the patches that you wear. 
Oh yeah, the patch. Oh, I gotta send you a Phoenix patch. I'll send you one of my Phoenix patches. I say it's a car patch, but you just stick your patches on, man. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Car and you just stick them on, you know. Yeah. Well, team one, man, West Coast. Yeah, West Coast. Am I pointing at that one right there? Yeah, yeah, you can see it. Yeah. If you ever been to Bosnia, man, you know what that one is. No, I never have. No. Filthy man. Nice. Is that a flight two patch I see with Beck on it? Flight two patch. Not on tip of the spear. Oh, there's, nice. There's some secret scroll ones on there. <laughs> oh, the Beck story gets deep. Trust me. Yeah. We haven't even scratched head surface yeah. operationally. If anybody knows anything, they know what that one is. And I have that one. He's a big question mark. Yeah. So yeah. that went to like another conversation about me and Damn Neck. Okay. Well, <laughs> team six and damn neck and they talk, talk about green team and all that other stuff and so i'm walking through my house right now so and i didn't go through green team and a lot of people and that's what everybody always yells about you weren't a team you weren't a damn neck and i go yeah i was a damn neck i didn't go through green team yeah. they called my phone and said hey and if you need expertise you need a phd frog it's not going to be all the dudes that went through green team yeah well how do you get the phd frog in there that has tons of experience because green team I, I tried to go to Green Team back in 95, I think. But um, at the time, they were taking like two or three guys from the West Coast. They don't like West Coast. Yeah, it's very rare. Anti-West Coast. And if you tell me yeah. that they yeah. hate the West Coast in the 90s at Damn Neck, you're full of shit. Because those guys hated the West Coast guys. Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. heard that from a lot of my West Coast buddies. Guys that you and I know from Team 1 that got shit on because of that difficult to go to damn neck from the west coast back in the 90s that it just didn't happen yeah that's a shame so here's my here's the house so i got a giant couch oh nice an awesome dog look at that puppy and there's no electronics allowed in this room and then here's the kitchen where all the cool stuff happens you got a nice house yeah nice. look at that shadow box Woo. Well, here's what stuff is. So I got my Viking horn. Oh, of course you do. You and got to. I do marriages. So I do the pagan marriages. Nice. And uh, and the thing is that the Christians gave us the name pagan for the ancient religions, which I think is wrong, you know, because it has a lot of connotations that pagan is bad and all this. But it's actually the ancient arts, the ancient earth religions, you know, and a lot of the stuff that we should try to go back to. And that's actually going back to the weird soul and going back to where we are when we're living in the beginning. Yeah. I'm in my backyard. Here's the back of my house. And, um, I got, Oh, look at that. Oh, right out in the woods. Oh, wow. Wow. That is cool. Oh yeah. gosh. The weather looks perfect. What a setup. Wow. And so if you go way back in the woods back there, there's some vision pits. So I have, I have vision pits. I have areas to really do some deep stuff that, um, I get into, and then I get into some of the really, really far out alternative stuff that I want to talk about on video, but <laughs> you have to be able to get your mind into a place so that you can see things or make everything quiet. And the thing is, you can be out here in those woods and you can really do the quiet, but it would take you without extra help to sit in the woods. It would take you about four days to start really getting into it mm -hmm. and you have water and crackers and so you sit there for four days with only water and crackers silent in one spot Jeez. wow you're getting into some really good deep stuff mm -hmm. and then on day six you start really getting it day seven then you're odin wow it that's took a long odin, process Jeez. you know it took odin all those days and all the time hanging from the tree for him to finally get the wisdom, finally really deep in. And the thing is, is like, you know, maybe that happened, maybe it did, maybe it's one of those old God myths that you see and you go, well, it's 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 the time that you have to spend in total quiet inside of your own mind with no disturbances. And that's the lesson. So maybe he didn't hang in a tree, but that's part of my religion. So that's what I do say. This is what happened. Sure. It's like the Bible, man. If you take it all literal and you say, this is what happened. No, it's the message of the story. You know, when I read the Bible, it's what's this story trying to teach you? Not every little detail is 100 percent because, you know, anything that ancient, it's been told, you know, yeah. over through the generations. But there's a message in the story, not mm -hmm. to take it literal. Yeah. 
Right. So it's exactly like Odin. So he hung in that tree for all those days and then finally grabbed the runes, the knowledge of the runes, and he gained all that knowledge mm. because he hung there for that many days. And you're like, well, if you do it, if you can go inside of yourself and you can be in total quiet and you mm-hmm. can be out there and you can literally do, you know, just your water and uh, the crackers and that's all you eat for all those days and you have total silence. You're going to gain some knowledge. I bet. And who's going to do that? Yeah. Ex- me and Odin and a number of other people. Well, what people can do is that's part of my morning routine. I wake up early so that I can meditate and pray. And every morning I do it, even if it's for 30 minutes. Yeah. Every day it's consistency. And I tell you what, when I start my days out like that, I am so balanced by the time I show up to work. Like there's okay. nothing that can come at me and catch me off guard, but I do it every morning. It's so valuable. Even if it's just 30, 40 minutes, it, it helps. The silence really helps. It does. Thing, I love the meditation part. If you're able to do it and you can come out here and I would do it, we would do it with you. And if you did 40 hours. Yeah, so that'd be awesome. 40, 40 hour meditation. And then every time after that, you do your 30 minutes. Yeah. You back into the 40 minute. What happens? So what happens when you meditate is the body remembers your soul remembers where that spot was. Mm-hmm. After you do the really long, the 40 hour and I'll do it. I'll, you're, you're, come out here, man. And then after that 40 hours at forever, every time you do your 30, as long as you keep up on it, you go you'll back be, to that spot. Nice. Right back into it. And then you yeah. keep. Up. And so check this out. So my house is right there. And then see the stream. Oh, nice. So I got a dam there with a bunch of water and then the stream. And all these woods. And when ah, you do it's beautiful. When you do it, there's a spot right there that you'll do it in. Nice. Heck and yeah. Everything. And it's but it's close enough that we can keep tabs and make sure everything's cool. Because yeah. you want safety measures too, you know. Sure, sure. Yeah. You make it yeah. safe, you do it good, and you're there, and then you get it done, man. Yeah. Heck yeah, that sounds awesome. If you want to do the first 40, you know, it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I dig it. I dig Good it. Stuff, man, we could talk probably for hours. I know. Yeah, we'll no, talk. but we've we've appreciated your time. This has been this has been awesome. So you've heard it here, Vibe Tribe. You've heard where to learn more about uh, the different organizations. You've heard where to go to get some of these new toys, which uh, I plan on doing myself personally. But I think the most important thing is, as we touch, guys, you're the Vibe Tribe. Everyone's free to pursue their own happiness. And if everyone tells you differently, tell them to fuck off. <laughs> Just that Absolutely. Simple. Hey, Beck, I love you. Thank you so much for your time. You've, you've been a dear friend for years and, and I look forward to many more adventures with you. Take care, brother. Cheers. Take, Later. Yeah. Later. Take Chris. care. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Vibe tribe. Be good. Clark. Love you. Love you too. See you, Bye. man. Take care. Take it easy, dude. Oh yeah. I know that you will. Yeah. Well, the dude abides. 